But for me, uh, the attempt to get the essence of a poem, by which I mean the way in which it moves him, down on paper, um, and sometimes as we discussed, it took him three years, sometimes it took him three hours. And, and we know this from song composers like Wolf, like Schubert, particularly Wolf and Schumann. They can get... It's interesting you mention that because there comes a point when instead of just keeping French song composers in their alley and German composers in their alley, we have to consider some of the great song composers, French or German or Russian or Scandinavian or American. And we have to actually realise that there is a thread of eloquence that binds them together, despite their language differences, their time differences, their cultural differences. It's a question of being able to use no more and no less than is necessary to create something magical hanging in the air that seems to be unanswerable, um, ineffable. Yes. And at the best of Schubert, the best of Poulenc, the best of all, that happens. It is a world created in a grain of sand, I mean. Absolutely right. And that's what's marvellous about song. And, and because of that, there are therefore song composers who are not great composers, who are not even famous composers, but my God, they'll come up with just a perfect Menel de Han, perfect little song. Not a great composer, not a great man, but my, with the perfect essence of that perfect poem on those two pages, you can't beat it. And countless examples. And I remember Uqueno, that wonderful man who died at 105 and who was a friend of Paul Anson, sang Paul Anson songs, and was an amazing, amazing person, really. I mean, he, there, there is a biography of him. And Queno lived a life completely different from Paul He was also moneyed Swiss, but he had a very gay lifestyle and he never seemed to have had a moment of... Um, regret or bitterness or angst or anything, maybe because he was not brought up a Catholic, he was more Calvin and that you can shrug off perhaps more easily, I don't know. But I always remember asking him when he was a jury member of a competition, well, how do you judge all these different people? He said, it is very easy to say who gives me pleasure. And actually the giving of pleasure is something that songs can do because of words and music and because words are musical and music is verbal yeah. and when those two things go together which they should all the time it's a happy moment whether it's shows someone writing a song about a hummingbird on the page now it's perfect no other word for it and it's a very particular really excellent word which is applicable to songs in the way it is just as you said even a Beethoven twin quartet, a late Beethoven twin quartet, what I call that perfect, I call that a big fat mess. I mean, it's amazing, but this, this thing... It's, and a, it's, it's, a, it's a word for something complete in itself and inviolably framed. Yes. And you keep on using that yeah. frame, entrant. So in fact, there Absolutely. is a feeling of, there's a feeling of, of, of a containment. And in a way, to know yourself, to know how you can best do things. I actually feel that by writing songs, Poulin slowly learned how to be more ambitious, not always with more success, but if he hadn't written his Eluard songs, he could never have written Carmelites. Yeah. Or the Sabbat Martyr. Yeah. Or, and they're absolutely right. And the Eluard songs are very, they are religious. As I keep on saying, they're about what we call spiritual things, but also there's a call and response and liturgy, which is which is ingrained in French Catholics, yeah. you know. <laughs> no more sourire et tendre. Yeah, no more sourire et tendre, that's right, yes. These are, these are liturgical songs, yeah. in a, and, um, and even the way they are on the page, they're white, they're pure, um, they're heartfelt. Um, but to get back to what you said at the beginning, there's when, a, when the music, which is inspired by those words, coalesces with the words itself. It is a tiny miracle. And it's like, you know, a chef might make something perfect and tiny. Um, um, but a chef makes a reduction, doesn't yes, it? Yes, Where, yeah. Whereby there's a small part of something which is years of experience and ingredients and everything somehow almost nonchalantly, but not nonchalant because it requires an awful lot of hard work, but 
almost modestly standing there as a symbol of everything that he's given his life for. Mm. And it's going to be very quickly consumed and it's going to be very quickly used. And it's not, it's, it's, it's a type of perfection, but it's, in a way, I think one must, um, one must actually say, for me, the experience of working with all this literature, and that's one of the great joys, discovering this literature more deeply and writing this book, is to say that it's time for Poulenc to come out of his glittering 1920s background. And now that the 20th century is over and we can see it in more perspective, he's a great composer of songs, of course, of his period, but Schubert is a Biedermeyer period and, and his poetry reflects his contemporaries ranging from Goethe to Seidel to Meyerhofer. He is a person who will actually survive on the concert platform. Yes. Because the big test is that singers and pianists want to sing and play him. Because they get it. They get it. I think he's a lost soul who finds himself in songs. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And weirdly, you mentioned Schubert. I feel that about Schubert as well. Yeah. A lost song of her soul who finds himself in songs. And song is not only something that they do, but something that is essential for their emotional and, and spiritual survival. Exactly. Now take Ravel, great composer, fantastic songwriter. He doesn't find himself in songs at all. He's a brilliant songwriter because he's a brilliant composer. Yeah. But this is different from this, from this guy who doesn't know where to be or what to think and latches on to combining popular music with abstract art. You know, that's a very good way for us to end because I think that song, for many of us who practice it, for many of us who give time to it, and for many people who composed it at its highest level, is a kind of refuge. Yeah. It's a refuge from the banality and the dross of the outside world, the pressures of playing the game on the bigger stages. It's time to go home to your own home with your volume of music and make music with dear, devoted friends, just the two of you, and sometimes singing to yourself as you play at the piano. It can be that much of a fulfillment just to have a song in the home, as you did so much at home with their exams. Song was in the home all the time at the piano being sung. And it is like building a castle around yourself and having a refuge. And if we feel that as we study it and perform it in smaller halls, not great halls, but halls just big enough to make the telling performance, if we feel that as performers, how much more so do the great song composers feel? And Poulenc deserved his place in, in the world of refuges because basically um, he contributed to that sense of uh, that we have when we take a song to the piano and create a little world around just for ourselves. And his travails, his shame, I love you use that word, his shame, his, his not knowing where to be, in being too rich, too poor, too gay, too, too old fashioned, too modern, or too everything. Um, I think it is a refuge there, and I think he feels safe there. And that's, and all that is forgotten now. It's great that you've led us in this book from those particular tiny things to the definition of a life. But actually what lives is the music. And a century from now, people will still be hearing those songs because it's human. I think that's a very good way for us to end. <laughs>